Grace, peace, and welcome to another rendition of Walk This Way Ministry Podcast, where the focus is living life a better way via discipline, discipleship, and duplication. Please welcome Pastor Stephen Monroe. Thank you, dear Lord, for those listening, as well as my partners in spreading the good news about Christ. And I am certain that you, O oh God, who began the good work within us, will continue your work until it is finally finished on that day when Christ Jesus returns. Amen. Our foundational text will be coming from the Old Testament, supported by a foundational text coming from the New Testament. The foundational scriptures from the Old Testament and New Testaments are as such, coming from Micah chapter 3 verse 11, her heads judge for a bribe, her priests teach for pay, and her prophets divine for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, is not the Lord among us? No harm can come upon us. 1 Timothy Chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from their faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Dollars, dinero, rubles, pesos, euros, yen, all different types of currency. They're all intertwined together. No matter where you are on the planet, especially if you are traveling, and if you are traveling and you're taking some type of currency, you may have to exchange one for another in order to get services and get goods. From a worldview, everyone depends on money as a source of survival. You would ask yourself, what can I do to get money? You have different type of skills. You are an athlete. You are an artist. You are a politician. Irregardless of what can I do, what type of skills, what type of talents do I possess to get this money for as a source from a worldview? What will I do to get money? This may fall into the category of all different type of crimes. There's all various different types of crimes, but you have to ask yourself, what is my price? And oftentimes that's the case. Everyone has a price. And that's from a worldview because they depend on money as a source of survival to get resources and goods. And you go according to your craft as well as your motives, as well as your morals. From a spiritual view, God is the source and money is a resource. You have to remember money in and of itself it's not really any harm. It doesn't hurt anyone in and of itself. Therefore, God knows what you need. God knows how to provide for you if you're depending on God. God knows you to the point where he knows how much money you can handle. He knows how little you can handle. He also knows if you will be content with a little or a lot or both. He will test you on both ends, such as Paul stated, I am content irregardless of what state I may be in, whether with a little or with a lot, I am content, whatever position God has me in. I want to illustrate something. I want to give you a little story. This is a story of a young man who was traveling, and he had to travel back overseas because he had to leave his family back on the state side. And as he was traveling, he kind of left all his, pretty much the majority of his resources, the money, to his family that he was leaving behind. And he was pretty much traveling on bare minimum that was in his pocket. But he made a stop off to see his brother before he traveled back overseas. Now his brother knew his situation, but nevertheless he asked him would he pay for the lunch. So the person who was traveling, he had no problem with that because money was not really his concern at the time. It was the well-being of his family that he left behind. But to the one who asked that the lunch would be paid for, he had a different agenda. He just wanted to get a free lunch. He did not want to spend his money on the lunch. But that was his attitude towards money and not the situation as far as the family was concerned. You have to understand, the bottom line is this. The one you ultimately depend on determines your God. Is money your God? Is money your source? Or is God your source 
and the money or the things that God provide to you, your resource. It's the inordinate attitude, over the top, deeply passionate attitude towards money will lead to great spiritual peril. Let's take Judas into consideration at this point. In Acts 118, just to paraphrase, Judas's blood money was used to buy a burial plot. We do understand that that silver or that money that Judas received from the priest at the time was to pretty much dime Jesus out. So really thought he was doing a good thing, maybe, or he was just doing it for himself so that he can get paid because one of his attitudes or one of his characteristics was greed at the time. And of course, we understand that there was some interest that the priests had as well. You see, they wanted Jesus out of the way so that they can promote their agenda. So you can see that even money they'd be willing to part with to continue to promote their agenda. The context of our foundational text is focused on the presumptuous errors and tentacle-like greed of the established leaders. Leaders ranging from Old Testament leaders of God's chosen to today's leaders in general. As we look at today's leaders in general, it's not really a specific group, but in a general sense, you could be the manager of a company or the owner of a company, the CEO, whatever the case may be. Or you could be a teacher, you could be a principal, or any, any position that you can hold that you do have a position of authority. This can be all the way narrowed down into the household where the parents, where the father and the mother, they are leaders. They are the leaders of their family. So you really have to make a decision at this particular point on what your core values are. So let's look at this. The first point being the peril of misguided power. Don't let your position of influence to judge rightly be compromised at any cost. As we can see in 1 Samuel chapter 8, Verses 1 and 3, of course. Samuel is old and his son's character is not like his. Now, we're going to give you a little discipleship thing going on here because you can learn what to do and what not to do. At this juncture in 1 Samuel chapter 8, we do understand that Samuel, as a young child, was dropped off at the house of Eli. Eli was the high priest at the time. Just so happened, Eli had two sons who wasn't doing the right thing within the church or right thing as far as following his father's footsteps. They were perverting justice, taking bribe, taking advantage of the ladies. Nevertheless, Samuel's sons were just so happens to be the same way. So that we can see you can be discipled in a right way and you can be discipled in a wrong way. You can be raised a right way. You can be raised the wrong way. You can learn what to do, but you can also learn what not to do. But as you become older, you should have enough wisdom and discernment to know what is the right thing to do and what is the wrong thing to do. You should always put yourself in a position where you can take wise counsel and listen to it as well. We also understand that even as that power is misguided, we can see that in Matthew chapter 26, verses 14 and 15, Judas and the rulers cut a deal for silver, exposing greed of both parties, which we just mentioned. But we can see that happening over and over again. Like, take for instance, Joseph's brothers in the Old Testament, where they hid him out. They wanted to get rid of him for some reason or another. They sold him to some Ishmaelites as a slave and received some money just to get them out of the way. Because Joseph was having these dreams that someday he would be a leader and the brothers wasn't having that. Also, we can see also, too, it gets pretty much closer in for his relationships is concerned where Samson was in love. He was in love with this particular person called Delilah. But Delilah did not love him back because she loved money and she was paid handsomely by the five rulers of the time. So as we can see, greed pretty much swings both ways. And speaking of greed going both ways, we can see in 2 Timothy 4 and 3, and it talks about itching ears. Itching ears is a two-way street. For the hearer, they want to hear what they want to hear. They want to hear something that's inspiring. They want to hear something that makes them feel good for the time being. They just want something to pacify them at a time. And oftentimes, if you jot to pick on the prosperity preachers, in which I am, they want to hear about the money. They want to hear about how can their finances be increased? 
how much seed money do they have to drop in in order to increase their bottom line as well. But now they're also on the other end of that deal, but there's some preachers out there or some ministries, they do want to give you what you want to hear. Because if you're giving them what you want to hear, then of course they're going to sow into that and make sure that you're getting paid handsomely to make sure that they're blessed by you. So as we can see, exposing greed really works in both directions. So all parties involved in this revolving door of heresy will eventually perish because of the words that are spoken. The words that you want to hear instead of the words that you need to hear. You're going to get misguided or pointed in the wrong direction by these people. But nevertheless, it's also the words that are very dangerous as well too. So if you're not appropriating scripture correctly, you can get the wrong understanding and you can apply it wrong. You can apply it in a in an erroneous way. So our next point being peril of false precepts, erroneous teachings and perpetuated untruths for the purpose of monetary gain is destructive for both parties. In Isaiah 9, chapter 15 and 16, we see that the kings, priests and particularly the prophets betray the 10 northern tribes by teaching lies, leading to punishment by God. So as you can see, when these guys right here were teaching or supposed to have been prophesying, sometimes they were just giving the king what he wanted to hear. And thus, the king is also leading the people in the wrong way. And the priests were complicit at whatever the prophets were saying. So all the time they was doing this as well, too, because we talked about scribes and scribes were like lawyers. Lawyers were the ones that interpreted what the word was saying, what the scriptures were saying especially in the Old Testament. What they would do in modern day scribes today, they would be called lawyers and lawyers would be using uh, a language called legalese. What legalese is, legalese informally refers to specialized terminology and phrasing used by those in the legal field and within legal documents. Legalese is notoriously difficult for the public to understand. So a regular lay person really wouldn't understand, but they would just take the word of the scribe, however he was interpreting it. And they would just go ahead and take him at face value since he's the lawyer, since he's the one who's the expert in the law, or he's the pastor, or he's the deacon, or the Sunday school teacher. This does not release you from being into the word for yourself. This does not release you from relying on the Holy Spirit to give you understanding of what thus say is the Lord. And you can also get that confirmation when you're talking to the Sunday school teacher or the pastor or even a scribe. There were some good scribes as well as one I would call to attention of. His name is Amos in the Bible. And he was a scribe as well, too, when they was leading people out of captivity. And what they did was he was they allowed him to read from the scriptures. And there was other people who understood the scriptures correctly. And they made sure that the congregation received that on that correct understanding from what the word was saying. And the response of the people as they got that understanding was they began to weep because they then found out through that perfect understanding that they was getting from the reading of the word that their ancestors before them was led the wrong way. And this is how they began to get into captivity in God's under God's punishment. So there you have it. There's no way that you have a way to study the word now, especially in these modern times as well. The Bible says you don't need anyone to teach you. You don't need anybody that you can call father to teach you the word of God, where you have the Holy Spirit, which dwells inside of you to give you understanding. You just have to have the heart and the will and the motivation to get into the word yourself. Treat it like your very life depends on it. Okay, especially if it's your spiritual life as well, in which it does. First Timothy 4.16 says, take heed and pay close attention to the words you use and how you say them, for they do impact the perspectives of the hearer. For the believer, consider your audience. Use your words correctly. If you're going to have to use a 50 cent word, use a 10 cent word just so they can understand it, so that they can reach it. But at the same time, you want to challenge them as well. That's the way parents do their children. They want to go ahead and give them the tools that they need and challenge them to use those tools that you give them in a beneficial way that it not only helps them, but helps them out in life so that they can help someone else in their life as well, too, generations down the line. Thank you for listening. We hope this has been a blessing to you. If so, 
feel free to like, comment, and share with whosoever the Lord lays on your heart. And by all means, subscribe to be notified when new content is posted. Luke twelve fifteen. Take care and be on God against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Jesus tells us that whoever believes in him will do the works that he does. If you are blessed financially, use your resources to be a help to those less fortunate. This is a way to show love towards others, and love covers over a multitude of sins. For whosoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. In the world of entertainment, the writers, producers, and directors, their goal is to convey a message that will eventually spark thought that will be popular to the masses. Now, does their message provoke thought to worldliness or godliness? That is the motive of the person who is presenting a certain presentation. What is it? Do you watch a movie over and over and over again and analyze what's being said, the actions of what's going on in there, how people respond to what's being said, or who's doing the speaking? Do you look at a movie that way, or do you just look at it for entertainment value? You ever notice that in just about every production, there's always a struggle between good and evil? And also at the end of the movie, you see who prevails. But do you look at it as going to be a continuation of what's going on in a part two, part three, etc., etc.? Well, this is what happens when the person who is presenting a certain message, you really have to take into consideration the character or the background of that particular individual. It also says in the word, too, that it just says if you place yourself under someone's authority, especially if it's in the context of getting a spiritual feeding, you are really subjecting yourself to whatever it is they have to say. So we're talking about the peril of the false prophet because they're the ones who are ultimately responsible. It also says in the word, too, the one who has the gift of teaching, they're going to be held to a higher standard in, uh, because of the message they are presenting that they are supposed to be a mouthpiece for God. If they are speaking erroneously on God's behalf and God's saying, no, that's not what I said, that particular person who is speaking those words may be in a little bit of trouble. Speaking for the Lord in error brings great condemnation. Jeremiah chapter 23, 15 and 16, the message of false prophets is perverse and full of pollution instead of peace beyond understanding. Death versus life. In Jeremiah's message in his whole uh, this major prophet that he was presenting, he was presenting a message that seems contrary to a world view or fleshly view. His message was surrender and live. Who in war, who in battle wants to surrender to their enemy? That doesn't make any sense on a natural fleshly level. We want to fight to the bitter end. So we want to, according to God, he says, surrender and live, surrender and live because there's more people coming after you. You want your children to live. You want your grandchildren to live, etc., etc. So that's the idea. Surrender to the Lord and live. Those who try to save themselves for themselves will perish. But if you die to yourself and for the name of God, for him, for Christ's sake, then you will find life. Also, we see Peter uh, influenced by the powers and the principalities. And he was telling after Jesus was telling his disciples, well, this is going to happen to me. I'm going to take a beat down. I'm going to be accused in kangaroo court. I'm going to be called guilty. And then eventually they're going to kill me. However, I'm going to rise on the third day. But Peter stands in and says, hey, this would not happen. We can't have this happen to you. And Christ or Jesus turns to him and says, get behind me, Satan. Because we can see that Jesus was going to practice what he preached. He was going to surrender to the authorities and he's given his life so that we can live. And he will eventually live as well. Matthew 7, 15, recognize well-dressed wolves by their produce, by what they, by the fruit that they give forward. This still goes back to saying you're not released for understanding and learning what the word says and when the application of it. That way when a false prophet rolls through or, or a bad pastor rolls through or a bad speaker rolls through, call him spell speaking for God or speaking from the word of God, well, you'll be able to know that he's gone in a different direction. He's bound for the fire trees, worship filthy money as their God. What that simply means is those people who are preaching the wrong word is only good for the fire. And that's where they're headed. 
great condemnation. But you'll know and you'll be encouraged and also you will get confirmation as well when you are listening to someone who is giving the right word of God, who are being exegetical in, their, in the scriptures or preaching and saying what God actually says in the word of God. You will be encouraged. And then when you begin to apply that word, you will be also experience the blessings from understanding of that word and be able to send that to somebody else or give it to somebody else. Now, as far as confirmation is concerned, let me tell you what I'm talking about. Two men on the road to Emmaus. And they was wondering what was going on because the, those two guys on the road to Emmaus were discussing what happened because Jesus was just crucified. Jesus rose up on them, but they didn't know who he was at the time. They didn't recognize him because the last time they seen him, he was unrecognizable because of the scourging that he received. Being up all night, being beaten blood running from his skull because of the crown of thorns. Of course, that's the last time they see him. So they didn't recognize this resurrected Christ who rolled up on him and they didn't really recognize him until he broke bread with them and they saw the nail prints in it, the whole prints in his hands. Then they rushed back to the disciples to go tell them that they seen the risen Lord. But when they got there, they had already told them that the Lord has risen, thus giving the two guys that was on the way to Emmaus confirmation. And that's what a confirmation really does. And then they're encouraged and know that all these things are true of what the scriptures said, what was going to happen. Now, I understand that all things sound like doom and gloom. It seems as though all is lost. Jeremiah 17 and Psalm 1 depict deeply rooted and bears good fruit for all trees. So we understand this particular word picture when it says that you'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters. We understand that this word picture shows that a tree planted by a river, its roots are going down deep and it's getting a very good up close and personal in private feeding and nourishment. So when we go and talk about we're going to be working with or conveying or conversing with the Lord in prayer time, spending moments in, in private time with God alone in meditation and memorization and reading the, the scriptures on your own all by yourself. That's what your roots down deep, going deeper and deeper, where we understand that deep searches out the deep. And the evidence of that deep feeding, a deep private time with the Lord will be evident and showing out in the leaves and in the fruit where everyone or every bird can, can partake and nest in as well, too. They can find solace and peace and confirmation as well as encouragement when a person who is deeply rooted inside of God. So that's what that's about. So who can you trust? Surrender to the word of God and live. Who can you turn to? Trust the Holy Spirit to give you understanding. Deuteronomy 8.18 says, God has given you the ability to create wealth. My father told me this as one time. He says, hey, be true to your craft. Be true to the work of your hands. Do it with the right motive and the right attitude. And the money will come. You don't have to worry about trying to go out of bounds or outside of your business plan to get the cash and get the money where you fall temptation to it being a source. And that's your number one thing. And what will you do and what can you do to get this money? But as long as you are doing the work that God has given you with your hands and you're doing it from the from your very heart, you'll be all right. You'll be just fine. It's understood that the deceitful allure of money is seductive. However, the challenge is to be so familiar with the Lord and his word that you recognize him at work in your life and you can recognize that which is false when it appears. So be encouraged. Amen. For the love of money is the root of all evil is an often misquoted verse in the Bible. It has been twisted and perverted to suit the needs of the person who is misquoting it. For example, as an excuse for not supporting the church. If we don't support the church, who's going to turn the lights on? Therefore, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions.